There we go with part four of a project. The last two components that we're missing now are the floating targets and the motion blur effect when we activate turbo mode. All right, let's start by creating a new targets component and we'll first need an array of targets. And for the time being, this is just an array of objects with a single center property that will be used to specify the position in the world of the mesh of the target. And it's initialized as a random point. And this function simply creates a random position on a cube that is one unit wide in all three dimensions. But you can specify a scale vector to stretch this cube where you see fit. And in our case, we'll spawn a random point on this cube where the base is four units wide and just one unit tall by using this scale vector here. And finally, we're looping through our targets array to spawn a mesh for each target. And the mesh will be positioned at the center of this target as specified by this property. And for the arguments of the geometry, we're using a torus geometry and the arguments are simply the radius of the torus. And then these ones are used for the tessellation of both sides of the torus and how big the tubular part of the torus is. Now we can add the targets to the app component and that's enough to spawn our torus but they're not exactly where we want them to be. They're below the surface and they're also all oriented on the same direction, which is basically plus Z and we'll fix that next. To place them back on top of the surface, it's enough to add another vector to the one that we have computed with this function. And this new vector that we are adding is just incre incrementing the Y component of the random point by a number between two and four. This is all great so far, but there's a slight problem with the setup that we have now. You'll see that by looping through the targets array, we are creating a new mesh for each target. And this new mesh has a separate geometry and a material assigned to it. The material is not too much of a problem this is going to be cached but the problem is that by having that many meshes onto the scene each time we want to render one of these meshes we'll have to spend a draw call while doing that and a draw call is simply us giving a command to the GPU to draw something. But in order to do that, we have to communicate to the GPU what it is that we want to draw, push some buffers into the virtual memory, and then let the GPU do its thing. The issue with this approach, when you have a lot of draw calls, is that you have to communicate back and forth with the CPU and then the GPU, then going back to the CPU, and then again, specifying to the GPU what it is that you need to draw, etc. And this back and forth communication between the two worlds is somewhat expensive. And this problem is unfortunately accentuated by these free meshes. Now, whenever we are rendering the reflections on the lakes, we have to create a new plane with the water material, which will unfortunately have to re-render the entirety of our scene with all the meshes that have been rendered prior to rendering this lake have to be rendered again to compute the reflections. So this means that these 25 meshes have to be rendered at least three additional times because of these reflections that we have on the lakes. However, it's not necessary for us to pay this price if we combine all of these meshes into a single geometry. And this part of the code should be self-explanatory. For each target, we are computing its own geometry and then combining it with the previous geometry that we were computing as the previous step of the loop. Then as soon as we have the geometry, we'll use it on a single mesh that will contain all of the toruses that we have created here. That's great, but all of our toruses are still pointing in the same direction. And we'll fix that by adding a new property, a direction property on the targets object and each direction will be a normalized random point. Again, random point is a function that returns a point inside a unit Q, but by normalizing this random point, it will be generated on a unit sphere, which can be used as a direction. And once we have the direction of the target, we can orient the torus towards that direction by applying a quaternion that we can compute between two unit vectors. The first of these vectors will be the standard orientation of the torus, which we have valid that it's plus Z and then by also using the target direction we'll be able to create this quaternion that is orienting the torus towards the direction of the target. That's awesome. Now we have a single draw call that is drawing all of our targets and are properly displaced on top of the surface and each with its own unique direction. 
Now we can move on to this tab where we can intersect each one of these targets and as soon as we intersect them we'll make it so that they disappear and get removed from the scene. All right the code inside this use frame callback will be used to check for intersections with our targets and if we do find an intersection we will remove the target that is intersecting with the plane. And how do we find this intersection? Well, let's imagine for a moment that our target is sitting on a plane and the plane where our target is sitting has the same position of the center of the target and it's facing the same direction that the target is facing. With this assumption, we can try to check if our aircraft intersects with this plane. And if it does, say for example, the one intersects here and another one intersects on this point, we can then try to find the distance between the point of intersection and the center of the target. If this distance is smaller than the radius of the target, for example, this airplane intersected here and this distance is smaller than the radius of the target, then in that case, we record an intersection and we can remove this target. And without delving too deep into the math behind hitting a plane, this snippet of code here gives us two bits of information. Projected is the projected point of the aircraft into this plane, so for example this one or this one, this is the projection of the plane position onto the plane, and distance tells us how far we are from actually hitting the plane. And I forgot to mention the plane position is the same variable that we are exporting from the airplane component, and once we have all of these variables, we can determine if the intersection distance of the projected point is smaller than the radius of the target, and in case it is, we are recording a hit and removing the target. This part of the code determines if we are close enough to the plane to consider it an intersection. We are arbitrarily deciding that if we are 0.05 units away from the plane, then it means that we have an intersection. And we're checking if this intersection is inside the radius of the torus. And if it is, we're recording a hit and then removing the target. And that's all there is to it. Now if I get close to one of these targets and I align the plane such that the intersection happens inside the radius of the torus, it will be recorded as a hit and disappear from the scene. And I'm also crashing my plane, of course. And now we're moving on to the last part of the tutorial, the motion blur effect for which we'll need an effects composer, which is a utility component to apply post-processing effects in reactor fiber. And I'm also using a U saturation effect to adjust the colors of the scene and increase a bit the saturation. You can play with these values and choose the ones that you like the most. This is where you can find all of these components. The blend function constant is located inside the post-processing library instead of reactor post-processing, which is just a wrapper for this library here, post-processing. For the motion blur components, we'll just take a quick glance at the algorithm. And I apologize if I can't explain this one in detail. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a way of getting the same results without using fragment shaders. So a full explanation for people unfamiliar with shaders would be really tough. But in general, starting with the basics, on this link, you'll find an explanation on how to extend the effects composer component of reactory fiber, and you can extend it in this case to add another effect, which is the motion blur effect that we're trying to create. So this snippet of code is just extending the effects class from the post-processing library to create an effect that we can use inside the effects composer from reactory fiber. And this effect requires an external variable called strength, which will contain the value of the turbo value that we are exporting from the controls module. And this is the difficult part, for which again, I apologize for not delving too deep into this one, but it would take its own series of videos. But the general idea is that this is a fragment shader. And a fragment shader is a program that runs on the GPU and decides the color of a pixel. It will run for all the pixels of the screen each time we are rendering a new frame. And the idea behind the motion blur algorithm is not too complicated. We need to sum some pixels together and then take the average of the sum. Imagine for example that we are at the top right portion of the screen and we need to shade this pixel and it would be enough in this case to sum a certain number of pixels in this direction going basically towards the center of the screen and then take the average value and return it as the color of this pixel here to recreate the effect. And that's exactly what we're doing inside this for loop where we are summing together two pixels every time we are doing an iteration of the loop and then after we're done 
we're taking the average value by dividing the result by 14. The strength parameter determines how wide this arrow here will be, and the longer the arrow, the longer the path inside our image where we'll travel to make our sum, and thus the effect will be stronger. And finally, direction determines the direction of the arrows, and positional strength is a variable that will be used to increase the strength of the effect for all of the pixels that are closer to the edge of the screen. And that's it, we're done. With this little touch of magic, our project is now completed. It was a short series, but it condensed a lot of knowledge that I hope you'll be able to use in your personal projects. And I'd love to see what you can create using these ideas. So please be sure to share your work with the community once you're done. Having said that, I hope you enjoyed this project and I'll see you soon on the next one. See ya.